I can't let you do this, Sheriff! Why? The security of the entire universe is in jeopardy! Just try and stop me, Buzz Lightyear! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, hi kids! Uh, I was just, uh, uh, admiring my, uh, collectibles. Uh, yep, Woody and Buzz. Had them for years. They're some of my prized possessions. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, anyway, welcome to another episode of Disney Animation Reviews. Uh, as you can probably tell from my outfit, uh, today we're talking about, uh, Disney's 43rd animated feature, which takes place in outer space. Uh, but first, we obviously have some Disney history to cover. Um, after Lilo and Stitch, which was a box office and a critical success, um, in 2002, the latter half, it was largely live-action Disney films like The Country Bears and The Santa Claus 2. But after those, uh, Disney finished off 2002 with its 43rd animated feature film, Treasure Planet. Ooh. Treasure Planet is... Very unique for a Disney animated feature film, it is an outer space version of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. It was the dream project of John Musker and Ron Clements, going all the way back to the mid-80s when they pitched it, back when it was called Treasure Island in Space, uh, they pitched it along with The Little Mermaid. Jeffrey Katzenberg, as the directors have stated, wasn't interested in the idea at the time because the technology they wanted to use hadn't been utilized yet. So, they had to hold off on it for several years, and it wasn't until after they did The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Hercules that the technology had come along enough that they could finally start work on Treasure Planet. When they started, uh, it took about four and a half years to make, and it's one of my favorites, actually, because it's so uh, different from anything they've done before, because they take a classic piece of literature and do something that no one's ever thought possible with that story before. And that's take the classic Robert Louis Stevenson story of Treasure Island, which Disney had done twice before in feature film with their first live-act, all-live-action film that Walt Disney himself did of Treasure Island in 1950. And then the Muppets, of course, did Muppet Treasure Island in 1996. But Treasure Planet was animated, which had never been done with Treasure Island before, at least not at Disney. And they did it in outer space, which was something very unique. Released to theaters for Thanksgiving 2002, a little more than five months after Lilo and Stitch, and about a week before Lilo and Stitch came out on DVD and video. First of all, uh, if you look at the last couple of years of Disney feature animation, aside from 2001, uh, it was two animated Disney features every year from 1999 to 2002. 1999 had Tarzan, and the premiere of Fantasia 2000, 2000 at Dinosaur and Ember's New Groove, Just Atlantis for 2001, and now in 2002 we have Lilo and Stitch and Treasure Planet. If you want to go back further than that, then the last time that happened was 25 years back in 1977, with The Many Avengers of Winnie the Pooh and The Rescuers, but I'm getting off topic. Upon release, Treasure Planet unfortunately wasn't the success John Musker and Ron Clements had been hoping for. It had a limited fan base, including myself. The reviews were only so-so, and unfortunately, it also bombed big time at the box office. Wow. Yeah. Only $38 million in America, and just shy of $110 million worldwide on a $140 million budget. But it does have fans, myself included. I'm a sucker for anything outer space related, like Buzz Lightyear or Miles from Tomorrowland on Disney Junior has always gotten me. Yeah, I agree. All right, so here's my thoughts on Treasure Planet and Jordan's too. Yep. So at the start of the film, via some narration from the late Tony J, who Disney fans will remember as the voice of Frollo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, we're told the story of Treasure Planet, the place where the notorious pirate Captain Flint led his famous treasure, the loot of a thousand worlds. The story is a favorite of a young boy named Jim Hawkins. Twelve years later, Jim, voiced for the majority of the film by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, is a rebellious teenager who lives with his single mom, Sarah, running an inn, the Benbow Inn, but spends most of his time solar surfing. A uh, pastime that frequently gets into gets him into trouble with the law. 
which worries his mom, Sarah, voiced by Laurie Metcalf, since she also did the voice of Andy's mom in the Toy Story films. One day, a dying pirate named Billy Bones, voiced by Patrick McGowan in what would be his final film role, uh, crash lands near the end, and with his dying breath, hands Jim the map to Treasure Planet, just before pirates show up and burn down the inn looking for the map. Jim and Sarah manage to escape with the help of Sarah's friend, a dog-like astrophysicist, Dr. Dalbert Doppler, basically the combination of Squire Trelawney and Dr. Lizzie from the book for this version. Dr. Doppler is voiced by David Hyde Pierce, also the voice of Slim the Walking Stick in Disney and Pixar's A Bug's Life. They retreat to Delbert's study, where Jim discovers the sphere he's been given is indeed the map to Treasure Planet. Um, of course, he wants to pursue the treasure right away, but his mom, of course, thinks it's a bad idea. But Dr. Doppler also has been waiting for an opportunity like this. Jim promises his mom he'll go straight via this quest, and Dr. Doppler assures her a few character-building months in space might help Jim, so she reluctantly agrees to let them go. On the voyage, they meet the cat-like Captain Amelia, voiced by the wonderful Emma Thompson, <laughs> and her first mate, Mr. Arrow, voiced by the late Roscoe Lee Brown. Uh, you probably remember him best as the narrator of the Babe films, but 14 years earlier for Disney feature animation, he was the voice of Francis the Bulldog, one of Fagin's dog gang members in Oliver and Company. Yeah, although, uh, when you listen to Captain Amelia's voice, she sounds more like Jane and Tarzan. Right, because uh, because she's, she's English and uses uh, proper language and whatnot, but not the same voice. Right. Because it's Emma Thompson, not Minnie Driver. Mm -hmm. um, anyway... So, Jim is assigned to work as a cabin boy for the ship's cook, John Silver, uh, who is a cyborg who Billy Bones warned him about prior to the journey. But mm -hmm. as the film progresses, Jim and Silver start to become friends, with Silver becoming the father figure Jim never had. It's stated in flashback via Jim's theme song, I'm Still Here, that his dad left him at a young age. Uh, but Jim finally gets a father-son relationship with Silver, but this is complicated because Silver, too, is after the treasure, and he and the pirates are planning a mutiny for when they actually get to the planet. <laughs> Silver also has a sidekick, but instead of a parrot, like in the book, uh, it's a shape-shifting pink blob of goo named Morph, uh, who's aptly named because he can transform, shape-shift, or morph, into everything from a pair of scissors to Jim's boots. Um, about halfway through the film, they also meet Ben, who's literally a robot that's lost his mind. Uh, he's the outer space version of Benjamin Gunn, a uh, former pirate of Captain Flynn's who he marooned on Treasure Island when he buried the treasure. Yeah. In this version, Ben's a robot who's been marooned by Captain Flynn following the burial of his treasure on Treasure Planet. And Ben can't find his memory chip, which means he can't remember much. But he ends up actually helping Jim out in the later half of the film. Plus, he provides the necessary comic relief, courtesy of his voice actor, the wonderfully funny Martin Short. Yeah, well, to be honest, Martin Short is funny, but I like the how Mother Hood Treasure Island, they have Miss Piggy as the character. Right, but that was really to establish the love relationship between Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy that's been around with the Muppets since the 70s. Uh, this isn't that kind of story. Actually, if you look, actually, there's not much that goes on that's lobby-dobby in this. Dr. Doppler and the captain do eventually become sweethearts, but that's much, much later in the film, so as not to detract from the main storyline of trying to get the treasure. Yeah. Um, let's see, where do I start? Uh, positive stuff. I think the voice cast is pretty good. David Hyde Pierce and Emma Thompson make the most of their unwritten roles, or underwritten roles as the captain and the doctor. Martin Short, again, hilariously funny as Ben. Some people complain that Joseph Gordon-Levitt Joseph Gordon Levitt made Gemma a weak main protagonist, but I don't think he's that bad. He's a really good singer. Um, yeah, but Jim doesn't sing in this. Um, again, I said that Martin Short was funny. Uh, Laurie Metcalf is pretty good, despite the fact that she's not on screen for very long. Actually, they've cut back on female characters a lot in recent years for Disney feature animation, because, you know, Ever's New Groove, Yzma was the villain, and then you had Pacha's wife and kids, but they hardly appeared on screen. Atlantis, you had Princess Kida as a strong female heroine, and then a couple other girls on the expedition that didn't get to do much. Lilo and Stitch saved Disney from that problem once, with Lilo and Nani being really strong female leads. 
And in Treasure Planet, you just have the captain and Jim's mom, and they hardly do anything. Although the captain gets a little more to do, but again, it's it's limited. Mm-hmm. Um, and Silver, uh, first off, animation-wise, I love his design. He's a combination of traditional hand-drawn animation and computer animation. The computer animation is what created his cyborg parts. And I like his voice actor. Um, Brian Murray does a good job balancing the good and the evil of Silver. It was really sad when Brian Murray passed away about one and a half months ago. Yeah. Um... I mentioned that uh, John Musker and Ron Clements directed this. They also served as writers and producers. Uh, once again, this is not a musical, but there are songs. Uh, there's only two songs, though. I'm Still Here, which is about midway through the film, and the end credits song, Always Know Where You Are, both written and performed by John Resnick of the Goo Goo Dolls. I'm Still Here is a good Disney song. It's one of my favorites. Um... And I feel really bad for John Musker and Ron Clements. They finally get to do this film, the dream film they've been wanting to do for years, and it doesn't turn out the way they hoped. But I think uh, this film is very underrated and deserves more fans than it has. Mm -hmm. It does have fans, including me, but I wish it did better than it did. Oh, also, in addition to the songs, I, I do really love the score by James Newton Howard. He scored Dinosaur in Atlantis before this. And his score on Treasure Plan is fantastic. If nothing else, you should definitely check this movie out for the score. Um, some really good vocal performances, especially Martin Short. And um, yeah, just try it out. Uh, see what you think of it. Mm -hmm. Treasure Plan's latest home video release was its Blu-ray debut in the summer of 2012 for its 10th anniversary. With bonus features largely carried over from the original 2003 DVD release. Including audio commentary... Um, although the visual segments are lost on the Blu-ray. Um, deleted scenes, behind-the-scenes material. Um, I think there's a virtual tour of the of the ship, the oh. ROS Legacy, and a music video for I'm Still Here, performed by John Resnick. I think the only new bonus features on the Blu-ray are intros to the bonus features hosted by Lori Metcalf, the voice of Jim's mom, Sarah. Uh -huh. Treasure Planet, despite not doing too good at the box office and only getting fairly good reviews, it did receive an Academy Award nomination for Best Animated Feature alongside Lilo and Stitch. Uh, of course, if you saw my Lilo and Stitch review, you know that they both lost to Studio Ghibli's Spirited Away. Yeah. Treasure Planet, before its release, was going... They were planning a direct-to-video sequel for it. Well, obviously, that got canceled when the first film didn't do so good. But the idea was, for the sequel, was Jim, after saving the day and getting the treasure... Uh, becomes a good guy. He starts obeying the law and goes to the Royal Interstellar Academy. And the story for the sequel was he and his new, uh, at first rival at school, but then eventual love interest, Kate, were going to team up with Silver, Dr. Doppler, and friends to defeat the evil pirate Ironbeard, who was going to try to take over the galaxy with a bunch of space pirates he had helped escape from a prison asteroid. Willem Dafoe was going to voice Ironbeard. I would have liked to have seen the sequel, though. You know, if the original film hadn't turned out too bad, I think the sequel could have been a really good storyline. Yeah. Um, Willem Dafoe did eventually get to do a voice in Disney in 2003, though, with Gil, the leader of the Tank Dane, and Pixar's Finding Nemo, so... Uh, so he wasn't completely lost from Disney. So that's our thoughts on Treasure Planet. I really like this movie. I'm a huge outer space nut, so... I think this movie is worth checking out once or twice. Again, I really wish it was more successful because John Musker and Ron Clements had been wanting to do this film for years. But it might be stuck with a negative reception uh, from critics and box office receipts. But I think this movie is worth checking out at least once or twice for anyone who loves pirates and or outer space and wants to see a different take on Treasure Island than what you typically get. Well... We're out of time for today, so remember, when you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. Farewell! Goodbye!